we don't always see each other. Not as often as we could, and not really. We don't really see each other. And if it's the case that we all bear the divine image, and we all share the wonder and beauty and mystery of God, and yet we don't always see that when we look in each other's direction. Now, we do cast glances here and there, right? But we look beyond each other or through each other. We, we sit in school and prearranged classrooms side by side, and unless you're on the front row, you're looking at somebody's back, kind of like Yertle on top of the turtles. You're not seeing each other. You're seeing each other's back. Or we, we sit at a dining room table, but not look up. We swipe pages on a device or move food around on our plate. Or we sit in a den or a living room in matching chairs in front of the TV, but we don't always look in each other's direction. And then even sometimes when we do, we don't see each other. It takes more than a glance to really see each other. More than a glance to really capture in one another and note in one another the image of God that we all bear. So why don't we see each other? Well, we're busy. And besides, we've already seen each other. How much could have changed since the last time we saw each other? Or, we have some conflict with each other. And it's awkward to look at each other and really see each other if we're, if we have this bad history, whether it's recent or long and lingering, it's hard to see each other. Or, it is possible, especially in the environment in which we are living, that we have labeled each other in some way that sends a signal to us that says, I don't need to see that person. We've discredited and dismissed them with a label, summed them up with one word, and said to ourselves, no, there's really no need to see that person. We can dismiss and move on. The result is that when we don't see each other, we don't know each other. And when we don't see each other, we don't trust each other. And when we don't see each other, we do not work well together solving problems that are in front of us. Greg Ellison teaches at a seminary in Atlanta, and he wants us to see each other. He has made it his life's mission. A couple of years ago, we invited him to speak at CTS. And you know how these public lectures go. There's an introduction, and the speaker comes on stage behind the lectern or podium and says, uh, it's good to be with you today in kind of a perfunctory way, and then launches into a lecture. It's the way we do things. There's the introduction. There's that formality of good to be with you, and then there's the lecture. Craig Ellison, before he said the first word, he went and looked every single person in the room in the eyes. Now, if the room had been, say, eight or ten people, you'd think, well, this is okay. This will be over soon enough. Eight or ten people. I look you in the eye, and you and you. Even if it had been, say, 40 people, 
But we were in a room that holds 425 people, and it was completely packed, and many of us were standing around the top of the room, behind the back row, unable to get a seat. 450 people, let's call it. And what Greg Ellison did, before saying the first word, was he went person to person, row by row, section by section, and he looked 450 people in the eye. It was excruciating. <laughs> It was also, for the first few minutes, it had the feeling of a gimmick. But that didn't seem to dissuade Ellison at all. He just kept moving person to person, row to row, section to section, 450 looking people in the eye. And then he began to speak. And he's been doing this all over the world, thousands, tens of thousands of people now, four continents. His initiative is called Fearless Dialogue, Dialogues, but don't be misled by that because his Fearless Dialogues don't begin with speaking or listening, begin with seeing. Well, then he spoke. And he probably talked for 20 or 25 minutes. And then, even though I should have seen this coming, I was caught off guard. He gave new directions. He said, okay, pair up with somebody. And people began pairing up. And I was standing around the wall and was looking around at a door thinking, I think I could slip out of here. But instead, before the chance presented itself, Wallace came and stood in front of me. Wallace and I don't have a good history together. We have been on committees at school and in the community and at civil but we disagree on just about everything, and I don't think we understand each other's perspective. And yet there we were pairing up. And Ellison said, all right, with the person you're paired with, look into the person's eyes and notice the person's face for two minutes. I don't think that many couples who are in an intimate relationship very often look at each other for two minutes. <laughs> two minutes looking into the face of someone else is a very long time. But there we were, Wallace and I, who had been this far apart, were standing nearly nose to nose and toes to toes, and I was looking at Wallace and trying to see him, and as was directed, making comments. And so I noticed the color of his eyes. I saw the gray and the black in his beard. I saw the contours of his face. And I continued to look at him for two minutes. And then we were invited to switch and Wallace would look at me to see the color of my eyes and the contour of my face and my hair. And then we had this time of sharing afterwards. And Wallace said, I believe that you saw me. And I told him the same thing. I believe that you saw me. I felt seen. I wonder if part of what's going on in this story, this parable that Jesus tells about the Pharisee and the tax collector, 
is that the Pharisee, not because he's a Pharisee, but because he's human, didn't see the tax collector. The tax collector casting himself on the mercy of God probably didn't see the Pharisee either. But the Pharisee is the one who says, thank God I'm not like these other people, these thieves and so forth. I'm not even like, blessedly, this tax collector. And there's something about the way the wording is that says to me that the Pharisee gave a sideways glance toward the tax collector, but didn't see the tax collector, because you know it takes more than a glance to really see each other. And so they're, they're, what's missing is that all the Pharisee could see was the tax collector label, not the person, not the rest of that man's life, but the label, and saw and heard that in his own mind long enough to be able to dismiss. Those kinds of labels don't suffice. When we really see each other, it's because we have not looked sideways or at a glance, but at with each other. And when we really see each other, well, there's the difference. When we see each other, we know each other. When we see each other, we trust each other. When we see each other, we collaborate on important challenges and opportunities. And when we see each other, we are reminded afresh, again and again, no matter how often we see the person in front of us, that there is the image of God. There is a person bearing the divine imprint. There is a person who brings into the world the wonder and beauty and the mystery of the Creator. The difference it makes is that before we know it, we have been brought into an intimate, vulnerable, hopeful, transforming kind of moment. Why? Just because for two minutes we saw each other. We no longer saw the labels. We no longer saw the stereotypes. We no longer assign something to somebody and said, enough, I know you, no need to look at you any longer. We saw the person. This is the gospel, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, or the way the message version says it, we are marvelously made. Marvelously. That is such a generous word. And when we begin to see each other, we begin to capture how marvelously we really are. And the fellowship grows richer. And the change becomes greater in our own lives and in the life of the world. I hope you can say what I'll say to you now. I hope you can say it to someone else this afternoon a couple of minutes here and there this week, I want you to know it's good to see you.